In a previous video, we learned about reliability. So now we're going to look at validity, which is a related term. They're not the same thing. Um, reliability talks about the consistency with which we measure something. Validity is, are we even measuring what we think we're measuring? That sounds like a really crazy question. But as you'll see in a minute, sometimes we don't quite get it right. Sometimes our instrument has flaws in it um, related to a whole bunch of details, which we'll talk about. Um, but just note that in order to have a valid instrument, it has to be reliable. So if you have an unreliable instrument, then it's definitely not valid either. Okay. So one of the first types of validity we're going to talk about is content validity. Content validity has to do with, are we measuring the content correctly on our survey? So this would be like on a survey tool, maybe a 20 item questionnaire. I want you to think back to some of the tests you've taken before, like some of your academic tests. Let's say you were taking a test about pharmacology and different kinds of medicines, and you studied everything related to the endocrine, endocrine system on this 50 item test. But then when you get the test in front of you, half the questions are about the urinary system. Well, that's not what this test is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be testing me on an endocrine. It was not, it did not have content validity because it's not measuring the right things, right? Because you certainly didn't study this stuff. I know it's frustrating as a student, I promise. I've totally been there. So what we do for content validity is if I'm actually creating a new instrument to measure um, nursing burnout, what I would do is I would construct this instrument based on things I've read in the literature, maybe some theory that relates to burnout, and then I would take it to experts, so people who were really knowledgeable about burnout. I would take them the tool, like a panel of experts, and get them to rate each question one by one. How is this question performing related to burnout? Okay, question number two, does this question really reflect burnout? Question three, so forth. They would circle it. There's a rating scale, usually like a one to five or a one to four. It depends on what scale you use. There's different ones out there. And then once you got everybody's back, you want to see how well the experts said you, each question was related to the topic you're asking about. It all goes back to your phenomenon of, or your concept of interest. So if burnout's my concept of interest, but I'm asking questions about compassion fatigue, though those things are related, they're not the same thing. So I may not be asking the right questions, okay? Um, so this is an example. This was an occupational health, I don't remember what those letters stand for, but anyway, it's kind of not germane to this discussion. So what they told you is that they went to five experts and they had them, they were all occupational health experts and they rated each question. If they got any question that had a content validity index of less than 80%, then they just went ahead and deleted it because it obviously the experts did not feel that that question was asking the right kinds of content. So what they said is after those five reviewers got finished with it, the CVI was a point a point nine six two. That means 96.2 agreement for all of the items on the scale that it was really good. So that's good. 96% agreement. You're not always going to get 100. You got five different people in a room. They're not always going to agree. And then they looked at each item. So questions one through 173. That's a big tool. And so those all ranged individual one by one by one between 95.2 and 97% agreement. So they, thus the researchers felt that that instrument had good content validity. So that's a good thing. Are they going to test content validity every time a new researcher uses this tool? No. Let me go back because I forgot to tell you this. Usually you only do content validity testing when you're first creating a new instrument and you're just rolling it out to the first few groups of people. Or if you're going to use an instrument for a new population or a new culture, like a, a language change, like you're translating it from English to Portuguese, you need to redo content validity. But otherwise, if it's been used in this population before and it's previously been validated, then a lot of times they're not going to redo content validity. So you won't even see them talk. Maybe they won't even talk about it. Okay. 
A second type of validity is called construct validity. This one's a little bit more complicated, so we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. If you go back to school for your master's or PhD or something like that, you'll learn a lot more about this. But basically, are we measuring the full extent of the concept? So let's go back to burnout. Burnout, that's a complicated, very abstract term. It doesn't just mean you're fatigued. There's a whole lot more to burnout than just feeling tired, okay? So if I just ask you questions about fatigue and think I'm asking burnout questions, then I've missed the boat. So I haven't fully painted the picture of what burnout is. And so there are very um, advanced statistical tests that can be run. It's called factor analysis. Basically, it takes all of the question on an instrument and it kind of sorts them into, into groups. So like these questions are asking about um, exhaustion. These questions are asking about um, personal accomplishment. These questions are asking about something else kind of sorting them so that you can make sure you've asked about each little piece of the full puzzle of burnout or whatever it is that you're studying. And just like before, usually you're not doing this all the time. When the instrument's first created and any new use of the instrument with a different group, different setting, something like that, you would want to revalidate it. This is an example. Again, this is very complicated. Um, I actually had to take uh, doctoral classes to figure out how to read, even read this graph. You don't need to know how to read this graph. I'm just trying to show you that this is like a three-factor personality model. And they were trying to make sure that all of the questions that they were looking at actually factored into these little three factors. Narcissistic perfectionism, self-critic self-critical perfectionism and rigid perfectionism, which they conceptualize as the types of perfectionism. That's all you need to know. We, we're not even worried about what those numbers mean right now. Okay, the next type is criterion related validity. And that is taking the scores of this one instrument that you just created and comparing them against something else. Often you're comparing against the gold standard, whatever that is. Maybe it's actually like a clinic visit where someone gets diagnosed by a clinician. And then you compare that against this screening tool. Whatever it is, we're comparing it against something else as, a, as like a, a, a secondary outside criterion. So we're going to do statistical testing on this. And as I've mentioned, sound like a broken record, not every time we use the tool. Usually only at the beginning or with new populations and settings and cultures. This is kind of blurry. I apologize. Until I blew it up bigger, I did not realize it was blurry. Um, this was looking at um, an antisocial process screening device. So they, this is psych mental health related. They were trying to figure out if they could use this little screening tool to see who was, uh, who has a tendency towards antisocial personality. And so what they did is they had all of these adolescents complete this tool and then they had each one of them go see a um, provider and the provider actually filled out a checklist on them to see if they indeed had antisocial personality disorder. And what they were hoping is that those that the provider said, yes, these are and these have antisocial personality disorder, that the screening tool would actually pick that up and that they wouldn't have a lot of false negatives or false positives, which we're looking at as sensitivity specificity. So that's kind of an example of what they're looking at, comparing this AS, APSD against a second type of measurement to see if the results match up like we expect that they would. So as I've mentioned, again, like a broken record, but it's important for me to keep reinforcing this, is that usually when you're reading about a study and it's using an instrument, a lot of times that the, those researchers are not the ones creating that instrument. It's been in existence. People have used it. It's widely regarded as a great tool. Okay. So if that's the case, sometimes the researchers do not even breathe the word validity anywhere in the methods section of that study. Is that okay? Not really. They should at least tell you the types of participants that that um, tool has been used for. So if it's a preoperative anxiety checklist and you're wanting to use it for older adults and the only people it's ever been used for were pediatrics less than 10, we have a problem because older adults' experiences of pre-op anxiety are not the same as less than 10-year-olds' 
experiences. So we would need to revalidate the instrument to make sure that it performs well with this new population. We may have to change up the way that the questions are asked for an older adult versus a younger child. Okay. So at any time you read a study, you really hopefully should see at least a vague mention that other researchers have validated this instrument or it's been widely used in the pediatric population or something to that effect. They should never just totally ignore validity, but they do it all the time. I guarantee you guys are going to read some studies and it will not even say the word validity anywhere in it. And that really bothers me. Try not to get on my soapbox. When you're reading a study, you should be able to discern whether this instrument has been used in this setting with these people before. If, they, if you can't figure that out, that means the researchers did not do a good enough job of telling you the information necessary. So we can't be sure that this is a valid use of that instrument. Okay, and one more thing, how I just said it is correct. We don't validate the instrument for everybody and every time. We validate it for a specific use. So for example, my pre-op anxiety, while it is asking appropriate questions, it's only been validated for kids. So I can't just go ask anybody about pre-op anxiety if it's not children whom it's been used for before, then I can't just assume that adults would see the questions and answer them and respond to them in the exact same way. So I would have to take the instrument and study it with a sample of adults, make sure it performs well, fix any problems, and before I just go out and do it and use it with a study of adults, okay? So even though the tool works well for kids, it's not a one size fits all. We have to validate for the purpose of which it's being used. So this is a little bit more confusing than reliability. I'll give you that. But hopefully what, with what I'm giving you, you'll be able to kind of see what you should be looking for in a study, which is at least these bottom two. If they don't say anything about validity, that's a problem because we cannot make assumptions based on information that's not provided to us in the research manuscript.